ओके स्टार्ट नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून एंड गुड इवनिंग वेर एवर यू आर वी हैव अ वेरी इंस्पायरिंग पर्सनालिटी टुडे डॉक्टर अशोक सी खनकर सो वी आर वेरी एक्साइटेड टू हैव हिम एज अवर गेस्ट स्पीकर टुडे डॉक्टर अशोक अशोक दादा मनुया ही इज इल्यूट chief executive officer and has been a member of the company's board of director since december 2011 dr khankar was the founding ceo of a medica a salt lake city orthopedic joint and spine ceramic implants company from 2000 to 2009 which he led to an ipo of a value for 175 million dollars in 2010 that's quite impressive in 2010 dr kankar founded blockster again uh, in salt lake city uh, it was a radiation protection company that was sold to an industry buyer in september 2040 and since early 2015 he has consulted with zenocor again in salt it's a salt lake city startup which was founded on a novel laparoscopy platform so we would love to see uh, dr kankar's journey also we'll ask question uh, once uh, he is uh, um, his uh, talk is over in 1986 dr kankar started as a senior scientist with salt lake city based uh, ceramatic inc where he rose to become a vp of technology so from 1993 to 1999 where he initiated uh, the company's solid oxide fuel cell program he has more than 27 years of experience in senior managerial position in ceramic industry medical product development and manufacturing uh, with responsibility towards finance strategic planning business development so a very very uh, experienced person inventor on 40 plus us and international patents uh, he is also an adjunct associate professor in material sciences and engineering uh, at university of utah and basically dr khankar earned his phd in material science from arizona state university so we are so inspired by your uh, a uh, resume dr kankar that i'm sure uh, you will be a guide a very uh, people will be uh, you will be most sought after guide after your uh, presentation so all over to you uh, we are very uh, eager to listen to what you have to say thank you anita that was a very uh, uh, inspiring uh, introduction uh, what i will do is uh, present my screen so that i can walk you through a few slides that i have made so let me begin uh that way uh hopefully you will see the screen everybody well, see the screen okay we can we can we can okay so i'm going to uh have the whole screen uh can you see the screen i don't see it now oh my goodness oh there we we can, can see, see the screen now. okay we we do okay we do okay very good so yeah. what i hope to do today is in the next let's say 15 to 20 minutes give you a quick overview of a very new and uh exciting part of the FDA's regulatory process for a particular type of product it's called a combination product a combination product is a product which it has a device component and also a drug component now traditionally these are rather challenging as uh samir latte who's on the on the call today can attest uh, we are very lucky to have him because he was at the fda and took part in developing the guidelines for this but essentially the framework for regulating such devices has conservatively always fallen to the cedar branch which is the drug branch and as you probably are aware drugs 
take a long time before they get released or approved for general use in the U.S. Can go from 10 to 20 years, phase one, phase two, etc., staged trials. That became a problem, uh, particularly when drug and device combinations began to take place. One of the most common combination products that you, I'm sure, are aware of are drug-eluting stents. So something that props an artery open and at the same time releases a drug that is anticoagulatory. And it has taken Medtronic and Boston Scientific and all these big companies decade or two to get these through various stages eventually to uh, the market. What we were able to do at Elute and two other companies in my prior experience is to convince the FDA that our combination product is a low risk enough product that it should be given a very special status called de novo status, which is a status where there is no predicate that you can compare your new device to, but yet show enough preclinical data that says it is low risk. And if you're able to do that, it's a win for you because you get to go through a different branch called the CDRH, which is the device and radiological health branch. So I'm going to tell you the story, particularly as it relates to Elute, but you can generalize it. So the story behind Elute is somewhat very simple. And that is, Elute's focus is development of a bone void filler, which is something that is used in the surgical reconstruction of broken bone. Say you have a fracture, you're playing soccer or football, and you fall and break a leg or break a hand, you need, and it's an open fracture, you need to be surgically set. What the doctor will do is put bone void fillers in your bone and put the bone back together as best as he can and then immobilize the joint so that the bone heals. This is a very commonly used device. There are probably 100 different types of bone void fillers on the market. Our difference is we have a drug, tobramycin, and the reason for doing this, I'm going to jump to a different slide here, is because infections in bone are a big problem. And what tobramycin does is it's a very well-known, safe antibiotic that treats the most common types of infections that are attributed to a uh, pathogen called Staph aureus. This is implicated in about 70 to 80 percent of the infections. I apologize. There's kind of show you such graphic uh, photos. But what happens is, as you can see, if you can see my cursor, these infections not only lead to very gross, open, purulent discharge wounds, but they also result in a loss of bone. And when you lose bone, it's called osteolysis. You have bone voids. And when you have bone voids, you have no vasculature, so you don't have bone uh, blood vessels. So there is no amount of antibiotic that you can take either in pill form or intravenously that reaches the site. So it's a major, major problem with almost one in four patients continuing to get recurring infections. So what you have to do is in order for you to be considered a de novo, you have to kind of convince the FDA that this combination product can be regulated as a device. So it's the CDRH Center for Device 
and radiological health branch. There is very little history, and I'm proud to say that Elute is the first company in the history of the FDA to have been granted a de novo pathway for a combination product about two years ago. And just about May of this year, we're the first company in the history of the FDA to be granted a IDE approval for 132 patient, which is a very small trial. It's a pivotal trial, pivotal meaning at the end of the trial, if the data look good and you can demonstrate that it is safe and effective, then you get automatically within 90 days clearance or approval for commercial sale of the combination product in our country. So that's the beauty of this. There is also another pathway for fast track and that is called breakthrough devices. This was created rather recently in the last eight years or so. And it, you have to show to the FDA that the product you have is so unique, so novel, that it can address a very, very large unmet need in a unique way. And that there are no prior devices or predicate devices, as we call, that you can point to to say that this is how it works and this is why you can compare it to and this is why it is safe, but it is so vital. For example, the mRNA vaccines that we all hear about today from BioNTech and uh, Moderna, these are essentially effectively breakthrough devices and they were given this fast track approval. So. What does the FDA really want to know? How do you convince the FDA that you have a low-risk product? Point number one, you have to convince the FDA that the primary mode of action of the device is safe and effective. So you cannot say, oh, I'm going to take a calcium salt bone void filler of which there are hundreds, but I'm going to take a completely new unknown antibiotic with no history of safe and effective use and use it. You'll never be able to convince the FDA that it is safe and effective. But if you say, look, I'm combining this well-known uh, device with a safe and effective drug, you have an opportunity if you present enough preclinical data that is safe and effective, that you have the ability to tell the FDA, look, it's an unmet need. There is no good solution. Our device does this and therefore consider giving us a de novo and regulation by CDRH. That is the most important, single most important thing you can do. So the first step is you present your data, your preclinical data, and most importantly, as I just said, focus on the primary mode of action and say, please give us a designation that this is a de novo. You have to, this is a very painful process and the most difficult part is as Samir will attest, you will have to face about 20 CEDAR experts, that is the drug branch experts, and answer their questions. And if you pass that, then they invite you to submit an IDE application. What did we do? Well, we were able to, first of all, convince them that we have a de novo low-risk device. But the drug folks asked us to show that the incremental release of tobramycin, keep in mind that patients who come in for bone infections after a hip or a knee replacement are given enormous amounts of antibiotics intravenously for six to eight weeks. But they're still concerned how conservative they are is the incremental release of a small amount, one gram over the course of eight weeks, 
does not cause kidney toxicity. So you have to demonstrate that in a sheep model. Then you have to say that the claims are very specific. The claim for our device is it grows new bone in infected bone, which is so far never been done. And second, that the use of the antibiotic is just for targeted local release and not for systemic release. So you have to demonstrate in the sheep preclinical studies that there is no systemic uptake of any consequence that causes you to look at two things. Systemic uptake causes nephrotoxicity, not evident, and systemic uptake also causes uh, antibiotic resistance, which is a big problem. That means the more you use antibiotic, the less effective it is because your body gets used to it. So we had to demonstrate those two things. Once we did that, we rolled it to, into a IDE application. Just so you know how big that application was, it was 1,250-odd pages of uh, paperwork, data, reports, etc. And once you do that, you're able to show that it is safe and effective, therefore worthy of a de novo fast-track application. The closest predicate, that means something that already existed, was antibiotic-loaded bone cement. Bone cements are made of polymethyl methacrylate, which is something that remains permanently in the body. It never, ever goes away. But here was an example of, look, Mr. FDA, you have antibiotic-loaded bone cements. The problem is they never resorb, they never go away, so you can never get new bone. This was something that the FDA was astonished when we presented these arguments. And we also pointed to something that a very large company, some company that you know very well, Johnson & Johnson, had antibiotic-coated sutures. And very interestingly, they took in seven years to get this through the uh, regulatory process. What we were able to point to and say, look, you have such devices. We did not point to drug eluting stents because cardiac devices are extremely uh, uh, risk uh, forward. And therefore, the FDA does not like to have any comparisons because they can easily put you in the same bucket as uh, drug-loaded stents. And once we did that, we were able to then convince the FDA. The key questions they asked us was, how did you select the one gram of dobromycin? Uh, and we had to answer those questions, especially to the drug branch. And essentially, it was a plethora of sheep data, uh, preclinical data that said, if we use something less, we are not effectively really uh, 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 suppressing the local infection. If you use something more, it's unnecessary. That's how we uh, selected the dose. I already talked about how we said there was no systemic uptake, so there was no issue of resistance. Uh, what was the exact mechanism that we were able to give the drug over an unprecedented eight weeks? This has never been done before. Eight weeks of a very constant controlled profile, as you can see here. The first 24 hours being uh, like a nuclear strike, high enough to kill all the local pathogens, but then drops below quickly and gives you a controlled release over the next seven weeks above what is called the minimum bactericidal concentration limit. So any new biofilm protected pathogens that emerge, they get quickly killed and allow the bone scaffold, the bone void filler, to assert its function and grow new bone 
and ultimately in six months disappear from the body replaced by healthy new bone. So I want to end my talk here and leave it open for questions. In summary, what I hope I have conveyed is we were able to convince the FDA, use their own guidance and show that a combination device, which is a device plus a well-known safe and effective drug is safe and effective for use as a combination product. The FDA agreed. We strategized um, how to convince them that it is safe and effective. We addressed many of the concerns from the more conservative side of the FDA, which is the drug branch. And we are lucky, I would say, as well as we were strategic in how we approached the FDA to have received the first ever de novo pathway designation for a combination product and also the first ever IT approval for a very short 132 patient study. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop and open it up to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Ashok Dada. This was a really exp expansive uh, ex uh, presentation. It was really uh, eye-opening, especially as you uh, the way you pivoted and the way you presented to FDA with a combination thing. First thing was my question also was in my mind that, hey, do you have to face the FDA with the drug? But then how you did it was um, really very novel and definitely we have questions. So before we go to the questions, I would invite uh, Nandita Bhatnagar, Nandita Tai she, uh, for some word of wisdom. She is VP of Clinical Affairs uh, with experience in medical devices since 2001. And she has worked as core team member in securing FDA approvals for five medical devices in coagulation market, of which two were special fight and KAC with uh, predicate device and three were traditional submissions. So I would, uh, we are very happy to have her on panel today. So um, let, she is going to moderate the session further. So I will invite uh, Nandita Tai. Uh, Nandita Tai, you are here, na? Oh, namaskar. Namaskar, everybody. Thank namaskar. you, Ashok. Namaskar. Thank you, Ashok It was really well explained. And a um, few things that I really liked about it was uh, how you showed, you know, I think it's pretty obvious, but very easy to fall in the trap that avoid the, you know, go the drug path. And that is the hardest path. So going, proving that it's a device and the side benefit is this, is you know, primary mode of action, as is a PMOA, that was very uh, illuminating. And the second thing I wanted to, I mean, I really like the, your, your um, eluting this thing that, you know, it, it improves the, or it promotes the growth of the osteoblast themselves. That was new. I did yeah. not, I, I thought it's just preventing infections, but if it can so, do more, much more. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things, thank you, Nandita, for those comments, you know, if you ask an orthopedic surgeon, when they have a patient that has a broken bone, open fracture, uh, say a road accident victim, for example, very dirty environment, uh, if they put in a standard non-antibiotic containing uh, calcium salt resorbable bone void filler, it gets lice the way mm. in two weeks and you're left with a seroma. You're left with a fluid, you're left with infectious pathogens and a purulent discharge, a very common problem. And the reason is the environment is so pathogenic that it invites a host of uh, macrophages that start a cascade of attacking the local environment and causes your new bone graft to be eaten away, to be uh, taken away, lysed away, as we call it, and further erosion of bone. 
So the local targeted release of antibiotic is a very important factor. And what we were able to show to the FDA that, look, without this, you're never going to get bone healing. And our sheep preclinical data were very clear. Yeah, so that was very uh, nice. And uh, so going down the CDRH way was, is the right way to go. That was interesting. And then my field is though medical devices, but it is, um, if anything, in terms of combination, it probably some things, new tests, new platforms that we are developing can just go towards like combination diagnostics, not the... <laughs> So this was uh, illuminating for me. And then now uh, I had one question before others also start asking. One was that now would your device be considered as a predicate device for some other products to come on the market? Yes, it would be. So once we pioneer this pathway, we make it easy <laughs> for competition. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the risk, right? For us as a small company, you know, we don't have the resources of a GSK or a Johnson & Johnson or a Medtronic. So we cannot say, all right, well, we'll invest 50 million bucks in 15 years of trials and preclinical work before we can release a product. So we have to be very strategic and say, let's get first to market and establish what we call in business as first mover advantage. The risk, of course, is once we do that, other companies can say, Are they, that small company has done it, why don't we do that? Now, we still have one big advantage, and that is once we establish first mover advantage, see what the large companies will have to do is go through maybe three years of preclinical studies, maybe more, because mm -hmm. they don't know details and will never know details unless they buy us. Uh, as to what mistakes we made in our preclinical studies that we had to kind of go back and do them again so that we were able to satisfy the FDA. So there is some advantage. And in the medical business, the three-year, four-year lead is, is good to kind of uh, establish a primary position. So that's the risk. That's the balance for us. <laughs> Okay. So since uh, there were no instructions, if people are going to put questions uh, in the chat, yeah. I uh, think we're just going to let everybody yeah, speak. Let, up. Because we have only thirteen people uh, on the thing on on the um, talk today. Please do uh, open your mic and do ask questions as you feel. Uh, Ashwini, do you have any specific thing? You coming from health background? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I I agree with what uh, Nalita Rai said that, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, very interesting because I remember I had read a paper a couple of years ago where a combination therapy was being used for or antibiotics were being used for a, a back backache and uh, there was a small study done that antibiotics could improve the uh, the, the uh, osteo you know the uh, degenerative disease of the spine so uh, again it brings me to this that the topramycin here is not just you know kind of uh, alleviating the infection part or the pathogenic part but it's also you know kind of uh, regenerating the bone in a way so uh, it's pretty interesting and I would have questions later because uh, since I am a part of a lot of these regulatory approval processes and um, I work more on the, so FD has this digital uh, center for uh, uh, excellence, right, for especially for software as a medical device and I work in that area more so. I would have questions later. I need to think through this for sure. Ashwini, Can where I, are you based? Uh, physically based? Are, uh, are in, you in uh, Bay Area? Yeah, I'm in Bay Area. Fantastic. Let's meet because many she, of us she, are from she, Bay Area. She's near you, Anita. Okay, fantastic. So we'll meet. Nandita is okay. like also. We are all very close to each other. So then you have a mm -hmm. uh, you have a question. Yeah. Ashok, thank you for a wonderful talk. That was outstanding. And I think I'm going to pursue you later to talk to our <laughs> students about this. This is exciting. Um, I, as a toxicologist, I have a question 
more specifically towards the preclinical development of this process, right? Um, yeah. So I'm assuming you you contracted this out to a CRO, and could you talk talk to us about a little bit about that process? And uh, because you know the preclinical toxicology for a com- combination device is um, a, a distinct part of uh, part of the process. Could you just uh, comment on that? Yeah. So uh, point number one, we did not use the CRO. But we did use uh, an outside uh, contractor. We used Colorado State University uh, to do our veterinary studies. Uh, They are, if I can say this not in a negative way, but they are known as the sheep capital of the world in terms of uh, medical device studies. Uh, They have an excellent uh, lab and group that supports industry uh, to do this. So they did all the distal femur defect studies and so on. And remember I said that the drug people really wanted to understand the incremental release of tobramycin and what effects it had. One of the part of the study that we did to look at that was we drew serum samples uh, at regular intervals and analyze those serum samples in a human pathology lab and found that there was no detectable tobromycin in sheep serum. So that was very, very beneficial. And of course, the usual things that you might expect, taking kidney slides and doing a pathological examination for a board certified veterinary pathologist. Uh, We also did liver slides and soft tissues surrounding the bone defect to show that if there is local release of tobromycin, that that does not affect soft tissue and so on. So we did all those studies. That was part of the toxicology uh, report, very comprehensive report that we provided to the FDA in support of uh, our arguments addressing the concerns that the drug folks had asked us. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 that's great. Um, Just to um, take it further, uh, you know, this is very unique that you work with the university lab rather than a CRO um, because, you know, FDA is very strict about, you know, where the data comes and all those, you know, regulations in place, right? So yes. What, what, what drove your choice towards this rather than an established CRO? Is it the cost or is it the expertise? It's purely expertise. Uh, it's not the cost. Uh, you know, many, many CROs have access to animal veterinary labs. Yes. But do you have specific uh, experience with demonstrating bone growth in appropriate models. Say in our case, our whole uh, focus was uh, addressing bone infections in the context of a hip and knee replacement or a shoulder uh, replacement. So there is a very specific long bone model that you have to use to get the data on. And we knew from our background search at that Colorado State Vet Labs had a tremendous amount of experience as evidenced by all the publications that they've had. So it was in a way no brainer. They had the deepest of expertise in this particular uh, subfield. Thank you. Ashok Dada, Shirish Ingaulani Hatwarkela, Tana Vicharyat. But Shirish. Um Hello, I'm Shiri Shingaule. Um, uh, namaskar. I'm from, namaskar. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer by profession um, with experience in orthopedic uh, implantable devices and Otherwise. past few past few years uh, working on uh, drug delivery devices and combination products. Um, so, um, uh, oh, where me, are you based? I'm in Boston. Uh, okay. me, uh, uh, California, uh, uh, Southern California, okay. and, uh, uh, and are you working for a company now? 
Yeah, uh, uh, for the last um, nine years or so, I've been working at Amgen, okay. um, primarily on uh, combination products. Right. Um, so, Ash- Ashok Dada, um, uh, I find very fascinating your resume as well as uh, the story and approach that you shared around uh, Elut. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, you alluded to some challenges faced by uh, um, startups or small companies in this space. Um, uh, such as resources, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, so uh, from that uh, standpoint, I'm uh, uh, curious about um, how your company um, uh, uh, manages things uh, post-marketing approval, uh, meaning um, commercial production, uh, uh, maybe complaints handling, um, uh, several other activities in ever-evolving uh, regulatory landscape. Uh, would you be able to um, comment on that? Yeah. So... Uh... First of all, Elute does not have a commercial product yet, but I have experience uh, on uh, medical commercial products from my two previous other companies. So uh, what Elute has in place is a quality system regulation and a management system that is compliant to FDA regulations for sure. And uh, also mostly compliant with ISO. Although we are not ISO certified, and the reason we have chosen not to go with the ISO certification at this stage is our focus from a commercial perspective is the U.S. market. You may know that uh, the world is is divided into 50% of the dollar term market for medical devices in one country, that's our country in the U.S., and 50% globally. So all the rest of the countries combined account for 50% of the market in dollar terms, not in number of devices used. So that's why our our, uh, focus has been in the U.S. But we have a full compliant quality system regulation, and uh, we have, as part of that, complaint handling, we have part of that, as kappas and so on. And we had to, by the way, uh, demonstrate to the FDA in our IDE application that we have the capability to manufacture and to address such concerns and be fully compliant with all the applicable uh, rules and regulations in this country. So we were able to demonstrate that. I think Nandita Tai also can put in her word of wisdom because she is in the same space and she i have seen her for past many up at least 13 14 years doing the same thing tai tumhi kai sangu shakta ka karan tumcha device ata manje post tumche devices post manje after marketing they are vivek thakre has raised hand vivek thakre has raised ek minute ha anand let let her answer then we will go to vivek no, but uh, what Ashok ji is saying is right. If you want to stay within the U.S. market, can you hear me? Yes, I yeah. can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so as long as you want to stay within the U.S. market and it's not a commercial product, they are okay. The minute they want to go, it's going to be another challenge, as Shirish might also be uh, you know, adding to that, would be that um, it's not just diabetes. Now, you combination products are also uh, will fall under the... IVDR new rules now, which would fall in like May 2022, which is not too far away. So I think, uh, but at, it'll be more applicable if you're like looking for a C marking or self-declared something, right? Okay. So at this point, you're okay. But otherwise, the PMA activities would be pretty intense under IVDR. That's right. That's right. Vivek uh, Thakre has raised his hand. Vivek. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Ashok Dada, for your great presentation. Um, I have like a couple of questions. So basically, I'm based out of uh, Austria, working for Novartis uh, as a pharmaceutical development scientist. Okay. So I have like a quick question, like four questions. So I'll just go one by one. So, uh, so this uh, matrix uh, which is being used for these granules. Uh, so this is uh, made up of calcium, right? Uh, calcium salt. So uh, when you started uh, like early development, did you try out like various uh, matrices? Like because 
typically polymeric matrix is also being used right in the form of implants for the uh, delivery of uh, anti cancer drug which are commercialized so just wanted to understand like, what have you tried at the beginning so for this particular application uh, calcium salts are very well known uh, examples are calcium sulfate calcium carbonate and hydroxyapatite which is uh, the synthetic analog of what bone mineral is but what we have done which is a patented combination is very unique and that is we have a polymer matrix uh, comprising of principally polycaprolactone and plga that combine these calcium salts together to form a porous matrix we have to have two things for a effective calcium salt resorbable bone void filler it should have calcium and phosphorus uh, which is the building block of new bone it's also a known uh, high quality scaffold for new bone growth we we heard about osteoblastic activity it takes place on the surface of calcium salts the second is it has to have porosity because porosity enables ingress of vasculature which brings nutrients and brings the uh, ability for new calcium i mean new osteoblasts to populate and grow on the surface of the scaffold and begin the cascade of resorption on the one hand of the calcium salt and supplemented with new bone growth from the osteoblastic activity so that's how you have to kind of balance it and so that's what we do the other benefit by selecting the polycaprolactone and plga is these polymers encapsulate our drug and they release by hydrolysis so it's a second order i don't know how much of chemical engineering i should go into but pardon me i just don't want to get into the weeds technically but it's a controlled degradation of the polymer that releases the drug in this controlled fashion over 7 to 8 weeks that is a very fine uh, engineering tailoring that we have done uh, in the preclinical work okay. does that so answer the question yeah yeah definitely uh, so you basically look not only at the ability to uh, release this uh, anti infective or antibiotic but also ensure that design of the proper matrix supported by polymer ensures growth of this uh, osteoblast right more correct. in the direction of tissue engineering uh, correct okay okay i see so uh, and my second question was related to uh, the model that you chose for the preclinical uh, study so very often we hear uh, for the preclinical studies uh, models being used those of like pigs or dogs or even primates so why was uh, sheep being used like is it only common model for such uh, application or uh you need so we began with the rabbit model the rabbit model was for pilot does it even work once we just said that it works in a rabbit if you want to go to the fda and alleviate concerns with respect to is it relevant to the target application then you have to go to what is called a large animal model and large animal model sheep is a well recognized large animal model the average sheep has a weight of 150 pounds uh so it may makes the average human that don't and so it works and the other thing is the rate of bone growth in sheep and the rate of rate skeletal of maturity is very similar in adult humans i see so uh, i had, sorry i had heard ashok that you mentioned about the long bone so the length of the bone also plays a role i guess uh well long bone only means uh certain kind of bones like the femur or thigh bone the tibia the lower leg bone these are common bones in which implants are placed 
the humerus, which is your shoulder bone. That's where uh, uh, shoulder implants are placed. So that's why I feel the, the, the common colloquial name is, you know, long bone, as opposed so you have, to a wrist or uh, elbow, which are not long bones. And uh, probably the joints, right? The ball and socket joint. That's what you're Correct. concerned about. Mm -hmm. Correct. Continue, Vivek. You have a third question. Yeah, the last question, a uh, quick one. So uh, this was related to science. The third thing is since you're into uh, like early development or you know not to the commercial stage, uh, has your company been uh, enticed by bigger companies like Device or Big Pharma's to acquire this technology? Well, we've been uh, in dialogue with two uh, very well recognized names. One, we actually received what we call in business as a term sheet for uh, licensing our technology. We rejected that term sheet uh, about um, two months ago. As soon as we put the press release out, uh, and we, of course, because of my background in orthopedics, I know all the top five orthopedic companies and the CEOs and whatnot. So we have been kind of on their radar, but we rejected that because uh, we didn't think it valued us correctly. So we are now raising a new round of financing. And I'm, I'm sure we'll succeed. So you want to get to a later stage so that you get more uh, valued? Well, the more you, you go downstream, the bigger the return for the investors in Elut. That's what it is. OK. Thank you, Ashok Dada and Nandita Tai for all the uh, insights and the uh, clarification. So, Ashok Dada, Mala, a question. I, if anybody else uh, wants to jump in, please raise your hand so I can. I have a question. We talked about uh, Vivek. Uh, you all of us talked about the sheep uh, as a as uh, the model. Is it possible to do something of that sort in India? Will FDA um, accept? any such experiments done in India as such? Is there anything, I'm just thinking about how we can take it back home. Is there a business opportunity back home uh, where these things can be um, done? As you rightly said, expertise was the main point that made you go to Colorado State University. But can such thing happen in India? And will FDA accept it? Two parts. So the answer is, Yes, there are veterinary experts in India as well. I mm -hmm. don't know about veterinary labs in terms of whether they do work as a contract uh, basis, but it is not hard to do. The question is, does that lab have standard procedures that the FDA, if they want to inspect, yeah. can check? And are they up to quality par uh, is the question. So if, if there is no harm or there is no barrier to getting sheep data from any other country, including India or any other uh, less developed country than India as well, provided that you can give reasonable assurances that the quality of the data are reliable and of, uh, of international standard. Udan has raised his hand. Udan, is, is it? I, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the same thing that Ashok was talking about. Um, there is, uh, there has been now uh, a lot of work done in India in preclinical talks field. Um, and we can call it outsourcing, if you will. Uh, the, the major concern, of course, remains is what Ashok Dada just pointed out, you know, our are they following the rules in a way? And uh, you know, are they are their expertise and standards? Expertise is generally not an issue. Uh, problem is that FDA doesn't have jurisdiction in many of these cases, so they can't go and inspect the labs. And uh, if they cannot, they won't accept data. So there are two types of data, as you know, GLP and non-GLP. And a lot of non-GLP data Correct. will be, yeah, a lot, lot of non-GLP stuff can be done in India and accepted. A uh, GLP is where it becomes critical. And in this case, it's clearly a GLP study, right, Ashok? So it's yes. not it's not that easy to just kind of yeah. outsource. Yeah. 
I mean, may, many of the drug uh, companies are going there, even CMC and other production wise. So second question is production wise. Is there a possibility that something like that can be built um, on a commercial basis, produced um, and manufactured in Maharashtra? I'm it's coming well. back again and again to Maharashtra, but I really would like to see if there is a path because in our group now, there are many people who are not really biologists or engineers, but we are also in touch with people who build labs, who do other things and very curious and interesting career path. So there is possibility now. There is possibility. That's why I am asking this. So the answer is yes. It can be done, uh, but I will say one thing from, this is my perspective. When you're a small company like we are, uh, very important to keep your supply chain very compact. By, by compact, I mean, you don't want one operation in one country, something in China, something in India, for example. Can you imagine uh, what would have happened in the last 18 months, we've all gone through this pandemic. International travel essentially went to zero. Uh, it would have been extremely hard uh, to gather data uh, and to verify CMC. We talked about CMC. Yeah. Does everybody know what CMC here means? It's chemistry and manufacturing controls. Control. And what you need to do is you need to assure the FDA that when you make a product, a combination product, that the manufacturing process does not alter the drug. And you have to make multiple batches. You have to show all kinds of tests to demonstrate that. It would have been very difficult, very challenging for a small company, even without the pandemic, to have something going on across the world. Yes. I am a big believer in keeping everything really compact. So I'm not a big fan of, let's go to China to do anything, uh, as many common uh, manufacturing strategies will, will espouse these days. But downstream, for example, once we commercialize the product, in the US, it is possible that we may say, all right, it's time now for us to explore overseas opportunities. And I am more than happy to consider, for example, India as a manufacturing hub for markets in the Asia, Africa region. Perfect place. So that's great. Anybody else has any questions? Samir. Uh... And then uh, Samir first. Is... Yeah. Shirish, we have to go to Samir. Sure, sure. Uh, and then we have to Samir, uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Ashok ji, a uh, very good presentation. Uh, being a, a regulatory person, I have a question regarding the uh, regulatory side of uh, your innovation. Uh, the, uh, in this area, there are two distinct uh, things like device and combination drug products. Earlier, that distinction was not that clear. Uh, and with uh, 2016 guidance, it has become very clear what is device and what is combination drug product. So uh, I was uh, wondering whether your journey was prior to 2016 or after 2016. And if it was prior to 2016, what uh, changes do you think, or do you think uh, this uh, clarity will be helpful to the industry? And I'm asking from this, uh, from uh, uh, my benefit also, because I was involved in that combination uh, drug product guidance uh, while I was working with FDA. Yeah. So uh, to be clear, the company was uh, started in almost December of 2011, so effectively 2012, so four years before the 16 uh, guidance. The initial efforts of the company were mainly geared towards uh, kind of fine tuning 
the combination of the polymer and the drug and the calcium salts to get the right porosity and to get the right resorption balanced against new bone growth characteristics. When I came on board, I came on board as the CEO. I was on the board of the company uh, from inception. But in 2016, when the main sheep studies showed great results, and the chairman said, OK, they call me AK. AK, uh, time for you to step up and take the company to the next level, which uh, I was happy to do. And I did two things. One, uh, I set the company on the right path with respect to getting the de novo designation, which we got in 2019. It took some time because we had to gather some data. Uh, so we took almost two and a half years. And then uh, I was, uh, while we were doing the, the toxicology and the study that the FDA had said, the drug people, the incremental release and the effect of that on nephrotoxicity or kidney function, we also developed a manufacturing organization and prepped them to go through the chemistry and manufacturing controls. So that was the journey. And so we were, we took advantage of the 2016 guidance. And I think it'll be beneficial. I think, uh, you know, once you blaze the pathway, once you kind of show both the FDA as well as all the competition, this is one way of doing things and taking it through de novo and whatnot. Uh, it becomes easier for them. It becomes a template for them to follow. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. And uh, like, uh, thank you for sharing your journey. Also, that definitely gives templates to the aspiring people like me too. Udan, you I'm have glad. raised your hand. Udan, uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to just uh, uh, ask you, Ashokda, uh, if you could comment on your personal journey. You are a material scientist. Yeah. And not let's, see, then, uh, let's see if we can get Shirish may have technical question, and then we can come to uh, Ashok Dada's personal journey. Is it OK, Udayan? Let's, Shirish, you have a technical question, most likely. It, it, uh, sorry, yeah, um, I'll make it very quick. Uh, not really a uh, question, but I think we were talking about um, uh, opportunities to take something back to India or Maharashtra. And uh, I had a quick comment. I think uh, we talked about uh, uh, you know, potential concerns around quality or compliance. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, for uh, businesses in the US, um, they typically go to Asia, uh, China, or India if there is any uh, financial benefit for them. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm making a very general comment, uh, but um, you know, if anybody has any insights or, um, you know, Things otherwise, uh, you know, you're welcome to come in. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, uh, to amplify what you said, yes, at the right time, for the right reason, uh, expanding a supply chain to China, India, wherever else makes complete sense. Uh, the, my, my comment was mainly pertaining to, in the early stages, when he, speed is very important, uh, speed equals uh, uh, efficiency. Efficiency means you get more done with less money, and that's always important for a startup. Uh, it's very important, I think, at least in my view, to have a compact supply chain and therefore, if all of your collaborators are close by, you get things done much faster. So Udan, uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, so sorry, I just wanted to know how did you become, come to run a drug company when you're a material scientist? <laughs> uh, well, 
So uh, my journey into medical devices was somewhat personal. Uh, you, I don't know if you can see this, but I had a cleft palate, cleft lip, uh, which required many, many uh, constructive, reconstructive surgeries. Uh, one of the uh, surgeries I had was in 96 in the US, where a surgeon took a small piece of my pelvic bone, what is called the iliac crest, uh, and struck a little part of my nasopharyngeal area. It's a very common problem that it's called donor site morbidity. This part healed in two days. I was pain free and fine. I'm a runner, I'm a mountaineer, and the donor site from where they took the bone was painful for six months. And I said, this sucks. This does not make sense. Why would you, doctor, take good bone from my body? And why can't you use something synthetic? And I said, I have a PhD in material science. I'm a ceramics expert. I can build you a bone analog, which is porous and dense in the right places, etc. And one thing led to another, and that's how I started my first company. So it's a personal journey. I don't want to kind of bore you with my personal story. That's very inspiring. No, that's very inspiring. Regard, Absolutely. But that's how I got into it. And uh, here could, I could am. You, could you comment upon like learning this whole process? in a new field? Yeah, I would have the same questions, like coming from material science, there is a lot of biology involved. It's not that you can't be just superficial in uh, your, your understanding of the basic biology here. And there are many other aspects of biological science involved. How do you keep, keep yourself updated? I think that's both of us are asking the same question uh, with a few different angles. So we'll end our uh, talk with that. We are already past uh, time, but this might be our last question before anybody wants anything, they can raise their hand. Great, so uh, it's really very simple. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. That's, that's the short answer to how you learn. I was very, very lucky. Uh, I have been literally in hundreds and hundreds of hip replacements and knee replacements and spine surgeries uh, all throughout my career. I, it's very common for me. I have, I have badges where I can go to different hospitals because I have connections with very, uh, very uh, many of these uh, local orthopedic surgeons. I also have gone to surgeries in India, surgeries in uh, Norway, France, Germany, and uh, rest of the country uh, routinely. So I've been lucky to have uh, guidance from physicians, but also surround myself with smart people in the company. So, Dave, uh, Dave has raised his hand. Uh, Dave, unmute yourself. Yeah. I am Devashish Kulkarni from Nagpur. And uh, I, I already missed uh, starting 15 minutes of this webinar. And uh, I am founder of Curanox Technologies. And we have nexus of around 200 doctors where we provide softwares and application solutions to them and we have uh, MR softwares and all that. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I would like to open a communication channel uh, between, uh, with Ashok sir uh, because uh, our hardware team is currently working on some uh, technology called CRM which is uh, 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 which is a comprehensive remote monitoring system and uh, they have some problems and which is about material related so that's why uh, 
uh, is there any way I, yeah yeah i think I, we uh, can share uh, ashok dada while i'm uh, talking about the programs if you can write your contact information if you are okay with that uh, in the chat also uh, dev the best thing to find ashok dada is on linkedin too and on of course garze marathi uh, uh, garze marathi uh, website so please do become a member check out our website it is uh, Uh, it's very comprehensive and you can see and that's where uh, so thank you so much ashok dada that was so inspiring and as we could see a lot of us were asking technical questions so um, you know it was great to see how technical commercial everything garze marathi can provide that basis i was very uh, apprehensive in the beginning of of our gmg forum that will people come here for technical um uh, help or will people benefit from such webinars because we all have our own societies and we go to them we listen to nobel prize winner people but then it's so nice in this small gathering that we can refer to you as ashok dada ani apan bolu shakto itka patkan so that is such a nice that's the whole idea of this garze marathi experience we are not looking for mass 5000 people attending and 2000 people attending we want to make sure that whatever an hour people have spent here they take back connections they take back points and maybe connect with each other to maybe in future have something tangible that can come out of it so that was great i'm going to share my screen for just one more minute um to show what is upcoming for us just for uh, just for a second give me one minute i am going to get my discord <coughs> meeting okay there you go um so we 